My name is Walter Gehring. I'm a professor at the Biocentrum of the University of Basel, teaching developmental biology and genetics. And I'm Deborah Walgamuth. I'm a professor of genetics and development at Columbia University Medical Center. And thank you so much for taking the time to, uh, to talk with us for this You're afternoon. Welcome. Great. I thought we might begin by um, maybe just you're telling us a little bit about your background, you know, even where you were born, where you grew up, and that sort of thing. Okay. I was born just before the Second World War, 1939, in Zurich, Switzerland. My father was an engineer from an old Swiss family, the Gehring family, and my mother uh, was, is of French origin. Uh, I grew up in Zurich. And uh, my uh, primary school teacher had a, a big influence on me. She was mm. uh, a dedicated uh, disciple of Albert Schweitzer, the philosopher. And she taught us uh, that we had to treat living creatures with special care. And she made us, for example, collect earthworms who got stranded on the on the streets and put them back into the earth. And so from the very beginning I was uh, educated in uh, to have great respect against all, even the most primitive mm. organisms. You sound like one of those kids who walked around with uh, bugs in his pocket and, and that right. sort of thing. That's right. I once brought home a big toad in my in my little lunchbox, and to the dismay of my mother, I opened it up in front of her, and it jumped right out at her face. Uh, but she got used to that slowly because I became a zoologist then. And I actually remember quite distinctly how I got into biology because my uncle had sent me some caterpillars. He was in the army at that time during the war, and he sent me a, a cardboard box with uh, caterpillars in it. I was very small, about four years old. And the uh, caterpillars had pupated. He had raised them. So when we opened the box at home, uh, it, they seemed to be dead to me. But my mother said uh, they were not dead. They were just in, in pupation. And they would develop into wonderful butterflies next spring. And that was a fantastic experience. And for my the rest of my life I have been working on metamorphosis of insects and development of insects because of this very fascinating event. So that made me into a biologist. At the ripe old age of four, did yes. you say? <laughs> That's pretty impressive. <laughs> That's pretty early. How did you end up, you stayed in Zurich for your graduate education? That's I, right. right? Uh, how, how did you end up there as opposed to a, another institution? And Well, in, in Switzerland it was the tradition that you would uh, <clears throat> go to high school and university in your hometown. Switzerland mm. is so small that there isn't much uh, place else to go, except if you, if you find a teacher who is very special in a certain mm. field, you would go to Geneva or to Bern or so. But uh, I, I was interested actually at that stage when I had to choose, I was interested in behavior, the genetics of behavior. That was my big interest because I had been working on bird migration. And it was absolutely fascinating to me uh, how birds would find their way mm -hmm. to Africa in the middle of the night or under overcast skies. And as a high school student, I had joined Ernst Sutter who took radar movies on the radar screen to observe the migratory birds. And so I wanted to continue on that study, bird behavior, about the genetics. How is this inherited? How mm -hmm. do they know that they have to go southwest? And how do they recognize uh, the compass direction and so on? But at that time, there was <clears throat> nobody who could really advise me in this direction. And the, uh, the best geneticist who was available at the time was Ernst Hutter. Yeah. And that's yeah. how I, I got into genetics. But he, he let me do some work on, uh, to finish up some of the work on bird migration, which I had started as a high school student. And uh, under condition that I would work on Drosophila later on. 
<laughs> which I gladly did and, and never regretted it. And, uh, and he was a wonderful advisor, so I got an almost ideal education. Yeah. What was the, uh, the actual topic of your, uh, of your PhD uh, dissertation? My PhD dissertation concerned the phenomenon of transdetermination. Mm -hmm. Transdetermination was observed by Hadon and a fellow graduate student of mine with whom I sh shared the laboratory in uh, cultures of Drosophila imaginal discs. So the Drosophila larva contains these imaginal discs, which during metamorphosis, they give rise to the legs, the wings, the eyes of the fly. Right. And uh, Haddon was studying these discs by transplantation. So if you transplant a leg disc from one larva into another, you get another leg. And uh, each disc is programmed to form a certain structure of the adult fly. But if you give this disc additional mm -hmm. time to grow bigger and bigger, uh, and Hadon invented that method, then all of a sudden a disc could switch the fate. And you could get out of a leg disc, you could get out wing structures. Or uh, <coughs> out of a wing, we once got even eye structures. And so that's like actually that. the transdetermination That's a transdetermination phenomenon. Okay. And I was... Uh, it was a, a very good time in Haddon's lab at that stage. This was discovered, and then the students came from all over the world. There were uh, good postdocs in the lab, too. Mm -hmm. Antonio Garcia Benito, for example, was a postdoc in the lab, and Rolf Nötiger. And I, each one got his own imaginal disc to culture <laughs> it and to see what he would do. And the team together then got a nice overview over this transdetermination phenomenon. And we, we described it in, in great detail, empirically, but the mechanism has never really been cleared up. Hadorn was a, a classical uh, autocratic professor who guided his lab with a strong hand, and mm -hmm. we had to be there at 9 o'clock and so on. And, uh, but it was, it was a creative environment still. Mm -hmm. And he also let us uh, in our freedom so that we could, we could develop Rosa well. And the one thing I got very early from Ernst Haddon, and that was that development could not be understood without understanding gene action. Uh, classical mm -hmm. embryologists had completely neglected uh, the genetic control of development. And um, Sadon had gone even as a postdoc to work in the United States. He worked with uh, Kurt, St Kurt Stern and with uh, George Beadle. And he had worked on uh, the first lethal mutation which ever has been isolated in Drosophila. That's the lethal giant larvae mutant. And uh, <coughs> these lethal mutations, of course, show that the genes are essential for development. Mm -hmm. And if you knock out one of these essential genes, then the organism cannot develop. And uh, uh, inheritance is not just there to give you brown or blue eye color, as the classical embryologists like Hans Spemann thought. Uh, Hans Spemann was never convinced that the genes were very important for development. And we got this uh, in imprinted on us from very young stage because Hadon uh, had shown that genes are very important to understand development. And that was decisive for my later career. But what I couldn't acquire at that time, which is very different from now, there was hardly any molecular biology in Switzerland at that time. The first molecular biologists came to Geneva to uh, Kellenberger's laboratory, Werner Arber and Kellenberger were in Geneva at that time. And at that time, the, uh, the work was concentrated exclusively on E. coli and bacteriophages. And uh, Drosophila was thought to be not very suitable for molecular biology mm. because biochemistry was very difficult to do on, on flies. So I had to go to the States as a, as a postdoc to to learn some molecular biology. So where did you end up uh, in the States? I, was it Yale, I, if I remember? Yes, yeah. I, uh, I got to know Alan Garren. Alan Garren became interested in transdetermination. 
and he came to Zurich to talk with Ernst Haddon and to uh, find out whether he could come for a sabbatical to Switzerland and, and learn everything about transdetermination. Before that, he had uh, identified the stop codons in the genetic code and had worked on the uh, alkaline phosphatase uh, repressor gene. Uh, now he wanted to switch into Drosophila, mm -hmm. and so he came to Zurich. And Haddon was very busy, so he put me in charge of Alan Garen. <laughs> and at the end of the day, instead of Alan coming to Zurich, I went to Yale and uh, <coughs> became a, a postdoc. And, in uh, his lab, then? In, in, in his lab, lab yes. And at the same time, I, I had a miserable, uh, Swiss fellowships were miserable at that time. The dollar was four francs 20. Now it's 122. <laughs> we so, know. Uh, <laughs> so my, my fellowship yeah. sort of shrunk into nothing when I was there. So they made me the, uh, uh, visiting assistant professor. They called me visiting assistant professor, and that meant I had to give a lecture. I arrived in August, and I lectured in mm -hmm. September on uh, Drosophila developmental genetics. I did all of these insults to the English language, which you can imagine, but in the front row sat three professors. This was Don Poulsen, uh, Alan Garen, and uh, Norman Giles, famous okay. geneticist. And uh, they were very supportive. They, uh, I told them everything I knew about flies, and so I learned from Alan then the molecular biology. And so this was a very fruitful symbiosis. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so I, I stayed for two years as a postdoc. And then I toured the country to find a, a professorship. Uh, Alan had arranged this trip. And uh, I had one very nice offer from Caltech where Ed Lewis was right. working and Seymour Benzer, and they both wanted me to, to come very badly to Caltech, mm -hmm. but the smog was so bad when I arrived there that I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't face moving from Yale, which is not mm -hmm. the world's uh, eco-center, but uh, it was much better than, the, than Caltech. And what and were you working on at the time? So at Yale, we tried to enter into Drosophila molecular biology, mm -hmm. and uh, at that time, just when I arrived at mm -hmm. Yale, uh, the lac repressor had been isolated by uh, Wally Gilbert and Benno Müller Hill. Mm -hmm. And there was a long debate between the, the lab in Paris with uh, Jacob and Mono and so on. Uh, at first, and Sidney Brenner, and uh, there was a debate whether the repressor was an RNA or a protein. The geneticists couldn't decide that, uh, and uh, Wally Gilbert and mm -hmm. Benno Müller Hill simply purified it from an overproducing, uh, repressor overproducing mutation. And so we knew it was a protein. And uh, when I came to Yale, I had brought my Nasobemia mutant with me. That uh, accompanied me for the most of my life. So uh, when I had just finished graduate school, uh, one day the secretary of Haddon came to me and showed me these strange flies with these strange heads. Yeah. And it turns out that they had huge legs growing out of their head. Instead of antennae, they had huge legs. And so, uh, there was this German poet, Christian Morgenstern, who had made a poem about an imaginary animal which can walk on its nose. And he called it the Nasabine. So it was obvious we called the mutant Nasabemia. Actually, later on, it turned out to be uh, an already known gene which is affected, that is Antenopedia. Okay. And it took a lot of molecular biology then to prove that it was a relic to antenopedia because there is no test for dominant mutations for allelism. And mm -hmm. so uh, this was a dominant mutation, very spectacular. And I, I mapped it because it was homozygous viable and I could 
genetically map it, whereas all of the, the two or three known antenna media mutants were due to inversions, which, where you can't do recombination mapping. But I couldn't decide whether it was antenna media or a separate gene. And uh, Hadon let me describe this completely on my own. I'm the only mm -hmm. author on that little paper, still written in German. Right. And uh, I was a, a graduate student at that time, and so I had no inhibition to speculate in the discussion. And I speculated that this is a gene which turns on all the genes necessary to make a leg, but in the wrong place, on the head, rather than on the thorax. Okay. Now the legs grow out of the head. So, and I was aware of uh, Francois Jacob's work on regulatory mutants, right. that is genes whose function it is to regulate other genes. And so I boldly called it must be a regulatory gene turning on all of the genes necessary to make a leg. Was that sort of the first time that this, the idea of a master control gene entered into your Yeah, this was thinking? actually, the, this is the, uh, the source uh, where, where this idea came from. And I really had no evidence at that time, but I, mm -hmm. I told Ernst Haddon and my fellows in the lab mm -hmm. uh, that I wanted to find out what the molecular basis of this right. was. And then, you know, nobody believed that I could ever do that. The molecular biologists thought that this was much too complex. You know, they worked on one enzyme, mm -hmm. got beta-galactosidase, or on one particular phage gene. But a, a gene which controls all the genes to make a leg, presumably a few thousand genes, now that, that seemed absolutely too complex to mm -hmm. ever understand. And the morphologists, the classical biologists, or the molecular biologists were asking the wrong questions anyway. Okay. So, but I, I didn't uh, get discouraged. I went to Yale, and when this uh, notion became available that these uh, regulatory genes encoded DNA binding proteins. That was the repressor was. Right. Alan Garn and I started to work on DNA binding proteins in imaginal disks. Now that was uh, what my postdocs call BC before <laughs> cloning. So uh, a, a, a little known era these days, <laughs> but <laughs> exactly. And, uh, and therefore, it was very difficult. But we ran these uh, mm -hmm. Alberts columns. Uh, Bruce Alberts had developed, he's now the famous president of the National Academy of Science. Mm -hmm. He had developed this method to attach DNA to a cellulose matrix. And we were running our imaginal disk proteins over this matrix and yeah. fishing out the DNA binding proteins. In retrospect, I'm very proud of that because it was hopeless at that time, but we were absolutely on the mm -hmm. right track. And NASA Beam, your antenna pedia, turned out to be a DNA bind, encoded DNA binding protein. And, uh, but that was only possible after cloning. Uh, so when did they, what did the sort of advent of recombinant technology actually fit into the developmental genetics that you were trying to... Uh, to develop, was this when you were still at Yale or later? No, or? I, first, uh, I first was a postdoc at Yale, then I became an associate professor. I was a, that was a funny mixture. I was an associate professor in molecular biophysics and in anatomy. And uh, I'm neither a biophysicist nor no an right. anatomist, but they wanted right. to have me there, and that, that was nice about the American system. If they want to mm -hmm. have you there, they will find some solution to, to allow mm -hmm. this young guy to start up. And uh, that was very excellent for me. And uh, after five years at Yale, I got this uh, nice offer to come here into the biocenter. And I had a, a, a very nice chance here to, to build up my own laboratory and uh, to do to do good work, which was not quite as easy mm -hmm. as it is in the States, but uh, it turned out to be extremely productive. And so I've been here for over 30 years now. It's never really changed that? ever since. <laughs> I was wondering if we could 
maybe follow up on sort of this idea of the marriage of uh, classical embryology and and genetics with a little a little dash of now the the uh, molecular biology that really enabled you to um, to get started. I came back here to Switzerland to Basel in 1972, and then uh, back here we started a very nice collaboration with Alfred this year in in mm -hmm. Geneva, and uh, the first thing was to define and isolate the hijack genes. This was to me a fantastic opportunity to go into molecular biology because here you didn't have this tremendous complexity. You had eight or nine right. proteins to work with right. and you could switch them on and off. That's mm -hmm. what I was interested in, you know, regulation. Uh, Alfred was a classical molecular biologist and in Geneva, Uli Lamley had developed the famous Lamley gel, which right. now everybody uses. Yeah. And they had developed methods to label proteins with S35. You could run them out on a gel and you could see many, many bands. Mm -hmm. At this time, they were still one-dimensional gels. Later on, they were developed into two-dimensional gels where you can resolve many proteins on a single gel. And uh, Alfred had this method in his pocket, and then at some stage he went on sabbatical to work with Herschel Mitchell at Caltech. And Herschel told him about this heat shock system, which Ferruccio Ritosa had discovered in Italy. When you expose larvae to 37 degrees for half an hour or so, uh, they formed so-called heat shock puffs. That is, in the giant salivary gland chromosomes, you see these puffs, which were, according to Behrman hypothesis, they were active genes. Mm -hmm. And you get eight or nine big puffs which would mean that there are eight or nine highly active genes, which were not active before. And Alfred ran these proteins out on a gel. So at normal temperature, you get the usual 5,000 bands on a gel, which you hardly can resolve. But after heat shock, it was fantastic. There were eight or nine bands. Hmm. And uh, it was exactly as uh, Ritosa had predicted. It was eight or nine genes which were active, and the rest was all switched off, not only switched off, but also the proteins were no longer synthesized. So what we did was uh, to join forces with Alfred, and uh, being geneticists, what we did first was to uh, make deletions for the respective okay. chromosome regions. And uh, this was David Ishorowitz who, who took this task. And I remember vividly, uh, he, at that time, it was still quite a lot of work. It took over a year to get the first deletion. And uh, <coughs> among these eight or nine puffs, there were mm -hmm. two very big ones. And then David took out one of these puffs. And much to our dismay, all the eight or nine bands were still present. Then it dawned on us that there was probably a gene duplication, that the two puffs were, which are very close to one another actually represent a gene duplication. And so we had to take mm. out both of these puffs mm -hmm. before we saw a missing protein. That was actually the entry point into understanding heat shock proteins. And then something happened, which has been a common uh, occurrence in my life. We discover something in Drosophila, and it turns out to work also in humans. So it turns out that humans have very similar heat shock proteins. Absolutely. And yeah. so if you get a 41 degree fever, and you think only eight or nine of your genes are working, you're perfectly all right. So. Uh, for a short period of time. <laughs> so I guess uh, what you were saying is that with the combination of biochemistry and, and genetics, you were actually you were the first ones to identify a puff and a protein together. Yes, uh, and just around that time, uh, gene cloning uh, was first invented. And mm. uh, I still remember that very vividly. I had a postdoc. Yeah. Uh, Elijah van yeah. Duysen from the United States. And we have this journal club uh, where we meet every week mm -hmm. and discuss recent literature. Right. Right. And there was this first paper, the first paper we read was one by Paul Burke, mm 
where he had uh, fused, had made hybrid phages yes. or hybrid uh, viruses, SV40 and uh, polyoma viruses. And that was the first sort of uh, attempt of cloning, right. cloning genes. And he reported on that, and I immediately realized that this was the way to go. That would allow us to, to go into the Rosophila molecular biology. There's a key piece of technology that really, after that, everything became possible in terms of uh, I, I, hooking up DNA and protein. At that. That's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. And uh, around that time, Paul Shadle wrote to me, and he wanted to come as a mm -hmm. postdoc. So at that time, he came from Stanford. And at Stanford, they had, at that time, it was very difficult to get the necessary enzymes to start gene cloning. Right. And uh, so I told him, you pick up all the methods at Stanford so that I want to establish a gene bank, as we called it, in Switzerland, mm -hmm. of course. Americans <laughs> called it a library, but being Swiss, <laughs> we have to live up to our standards. We call no, it a okay. gene bank. Okay. I wanted to make a gene bank, and I asked Paul to, to bring along uh, the, the know-how, and mm -hmm. if possible, some enzymes, some of the enzymes, some we then purified ourselves in Basel, yeah. and we... Uh, we started gene cloning. And there was another very lucky event. At the same time, Spiro Sartavanis, a Greek postdoc, also had uh, gotten interested in, in our work. And he was at the MRC in Cambridge. And so Schädel and Sartavanis formed mm -hmm. a wonderful team. And then the two of them, together with Ruth Stewart, a, a graduate student, they established the first European was right. offered a gene bank. And right. this is when the collaboration with Alfred Tissier mm -hmm. comes in. <clears throat> we had the gene bank, and they uh, made the messenger RNA in, uh, in Geneva. So they took tissue culture cells, heat chucked the cells, isolated the messenger RNA, labeled the messenger RNA, and mm -hmm. then it was brought to, to Basel mm -hmm. uh, by car or by train. <laughs> And then uh, we screened our gene bank. Around the same time, Messelson's group and, and our groups with Alfred Tissier cloned the first mm -hmm. heat shock genes. The sequence was done then, of our gene was done in Geneva. It was still Maxim Gilbert sequencing at that yeah. time, and we didn't know how to do that. But in Geneva, they had uh, already developed those methods, and they so they sequenced our heat shock gene. That was my, my first uh, really important gene to be cloned. Something really new. Some uh, with basically. some kind of physio overt physiological context. Right, yeah. right. And uh, then in the microbiology department, they, they looked at the hybrid phages and they, there is the so-called R-loop technique where you can actually illustrate where the gene is located in your circular plasmid. They produced the first pictures so you could see the clone yeah. gene f with your I naked that. eye here. That was, a, that was a, great, a great moment. Pretty exciting. Yeah. Yes. But I guess underlying that, Walter, if I'm, f if I'm figuring out, the heat shock was a tremendous way to get started into this whole idea of cloning genes of, yeah. of, 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 of interest. And I would wonder, with given your long interest in the class of homeotic uh, genes, was that Antenopedia? Oh, still, uh, still lurking yeah, there. Yeah, this is still <laughs> in the back of my right. mind, and actually we continued to work on it. And uh, at that time, uh, it was time to go back to Antenopedia. So the, the heat shock genes were mm. sort of a test run. Right, right. But then David Hogness and collaborators had developed a method where you could clone any gene as long as, you, mm. even if you knew nothing about its biochemistry, as long as you knew where it sits on the chromosome. And this method is called chromosome walking. Nowadays right. it's called positional cloning. But uh, <coughs> this allowed us then to clone Antenopedia. And so uh, David came here on sabbatical and uh, <coughs> 
it was a, a very nice friendship which, which has developed between him and myself. And uh, he came actually here, that's a funny story too, he came here with mm -hmm. sequences of the histone genes. They had been cloned okay. by uh, Mike Goldberg, who was later my postdocs. Mike had cloned the histone genes and sequenced, sequenced them. And David Hognes came here with a bundle of uh, computer outprints with these sequences. And then uh, I gave him a little room where he, which he could use as an office or as a lab. And, uh, and there he discovered the Tata box. It was actually discovered at the Biocenter <laughs> when he was on sabbatical. Wow. And so we named the room after, after uh, David Hognes. We named the room then the Hognes box. And you can still see it up <laughs> on, the, on the second floor is yeah. the, the so-called Hognes box. Not only did he bring that, but he, he uh, mm -hmm. taught us the, the methods of the, uh, walking along the chromosome. Right. And then I uh, worked, and he had started walking towards the bithorax uh, complex. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I, of course, was very interested in Antennapedia, mm -hmm. and so we started walking towards Antennapedia. But they were much further ahead, and they were clearly fir the first homeotic gene was cloned by Welcome Bender, Pierre Spirer, and David Hognes, with the help of Ed Lewis, who had provided the necessary mutants to, to map the chromosome mm -hmm. walk. Now, the, question, the problem with Antennapedia was that uh, there was a lot of confusing data in the literature, which mm -hmm. I had clarified to some extent with my Nasabelia mutant. Right. The first mutation with a similar phenotype was called Aristopedia. Aristopedia transforms only the tip of the antenna into a tip of a leg, that is, into a torsus, into a foot. So the arista, which is the terminal piece of the antenna, is mm -hmm. transformed into a torsus. That was a well-known mutation called Aristopedia. And then, in the around 1940, uh, Le Calvé in Belgium and you at Caltech in Ed Lewis's lab, they found uh, mutations which had a different phenotype, which had a complete leg, or co in extreme cases a right. complete leg, not just a foot, but a right. complete leg. Luc Galvez, who found it as an inversion of the right. chromosome, he named it uh, Aristopedia dominant. He thought okay. it was a dominant allele mm -hmm. of Aristopedia. Mm -hmm. Well, when I found the Nasobemia mutant, which is not associated with an inversion, I could map it. And the yeah. map position did not coincide at all. It was very far away. It was around cytologically around 84B, and Aristopedia is 89. But Nasobemia and Antenopedia mapped extremely closely to one another. The question is, if you have an inversion, uh, the mutation could be due to the breakpoint is at one end or at the mm -hmm. other end of the mm -hmm. inversion. Mm -hmm. And so since more and more antennapedia inversions became available uh, and we had a mutation which did not associate with an inversion, we could, find, we could uh, see that all these inversions shared one breakpoint at 84A or B. So, we determined the position of Antennapedia, and uh, Linsley uh, also helped us with that to 84B, and Tom Kaufman was also involved in that. So uh, it was clear that Antennapedia must be around 84B. So this was our target. Now, how do you walk to 84B? And uh, so we had isolated a number of clones from our gene bank, and we took the nearest one which was at 84F, and then tried to walk uh, to Antennapedia. Now, uh, you can greatly abbreviate your walk if you have a structural mutation, like an inversion, which uh, allows you to jump very large distances. This was also right. pioneered by, by David. And, uh, and so we, we had an inversion which had one breakpoint close to 84F, and one close to Antennapedia, mm -hmm. 
And then we jumped over towards Antenopedia, and it turns out that Antenopedia was gigantic. It was 100 kilobases long, which was the longest gene known at that time, yeah. with huge introns. And then the question came, how do you find out where Antenopedia is? You have yeah. a stretch of DNA, and then you, have, you should be able to map the breakpoints mm -hmm. of these inversions, and there were also deletions, and so on. So we mapped these inversions and deletion breakpoints on the DNA. And now the question was, uh, where are the exons? And again, it was uh, the help of the Stanford people which allowed mm -hmm. us to do that because Michel Goldschmidt, a postdoc in David Hognes' lab, had made one of the first cDNA libraries from Drosophila embryos. And so we looked for cDNAs which would hybridize to the cloned, right. to the cloned region. Right. And then you, if you have the cDNA, of course, that contains only the exons. And so you can map the exons on your chromosomal walk. And that's what Rick Garber did. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the result was that uh, the exons were spread over 100 kilobases, very far apart. And there were huge introns in between. Mm -hmm. And uh, the inversion breakpoints were in this huge intron. So that explains why you find so many inversions yeah. in Antenopedia, because in the intron, the breakpoint doesn't do too much damage if there is no regulatory information in the intron. Mm -hmm. And therefore, there were a large number of breakpoints in this gigantic intron. But then, Rick Garber mapped the exons on the DNA with the cDNAs. And much to our surprise, uh, we knew Antenopedia must be within this segment right. as defined by deletions, which include or exclude Antenopedia. Right. And there was one band of cross hybridization outside ah. of Antenopedia. Okay. And that was the first sign of the homeobox. That I'm quite firm about. Uh, some of my other postdocs don't want to give him enough credit for that. But starting from that point, then Bill McGuinness uh, joined my lab and uh, Michael Levine joined it. And, uh, and Bill really deserves the credit for having pinned down this cross-hybridization. It turned yeah. out that outside of Antenopedia was another gene, mm -hmm. which we know now is called Fujitarazu, Japanese name. And uh, there was this cross-hybridization between the last exon of Antenopedia and the Fujitarazu gene. And the cross-hybridization was due to a small segment of DNA, which was conserved in the two genes. And that we called the homeobox. We actually called it not immediately the homeobox. Mm -hmm. But when I saw this cross-homology yeah. between uh, Antenopedia and an outside gene, uh, we were actually looking for this, something like this. Why? Because Ed Lewis, who had started working on the bithorax complex when I was about f five years old. I think his first paper is 1944, so I was about five years old then. Uh, Ed Lewis had uh, postulated that the homeotic genes were arising by tandem duplications. And if they arise by tandem duplications, it's very likely that they still share certain sequences. And so right. we were looking for shared sequences along our walk. And, uh, mm -hmm. and I had discussed this with Rick before, and Rick Garber found this uh, cross homology to the Fujitarasu gene. So when we saw this, I immediately went to the phone and called Dave Hognes and Pierre Spirer in Geneva and asked, him, asked them for their bithorax clones because uh, the idea was that maybe homeotic genes share something. I mean, see, if they arose all by duplications, mm -hmm. they might still share some common element. And uh, we asked actually only for, for two kinds of clones, some from the five prime end and some from the three prime exon, because 
In Antenapedia, it was at the three prime end. And in Fujitarazzi, it was also at the three prime end. We first got the ends wrong in Fujitarazzi, but then we sorted oh, it never out. Mind, right? And then finally, uh, so yeah. we looked three mm -hmm. prime end of, of ultra bithorax, and sure, sure enough, enough, it was there. there. Was a band. I hybridized. Yeah. And, and then we called it the homeo box, mm -hmm. which was a, a crazy name, but it, it seemed to be something characteristic for homeotic genes. Mm -hmm. And we called it a box because it's a well-defined piece of 180 base pairs encoding 60 amino acids, was sequenced by Will McGuinness, pinned down, right. and, uh, and then, then I knew we were on to something, something very important. So finding this conserved motif was, yep. was exciting enough, it's but it's I, if it's I remember yep. you know, the time. Um, but again, you're stressing that these were these are all still all fly genes, That's and right. uh, and in fact ones that may have actually risen by by duplication. So finding conserved regions between duplicated genes right. is is exciting. And I think the exciting part was that they were all clearly development regulating, or at least that was right. the, the common theme. Right. So then there was a time when. I think it was around the same time when the idea of, well, could these be found in other related species or, right. or other, other Drosophila, other flies, or, or even other species? Yes. Uh, this idea came up actually very early, but uh, I should say something else. First of all, we were not alone cloning Antenopedia, mm -hmm. and uh, Matt Scott had done pretty much the same yeah. chromosome walk as we did, but starting from a different point, but uh, then completely independently in the lab. He also mapped repetitive sequences, and he found the homology to Fujitarazu. And from David, he also got the, the UBX clones. Mm -hmm. So we checked up on each other, and the results were absolutely consistent. We named it the homeo box, and then we went beyond that. You know, if, the, if that were confined just to Drosophila, right. nobody would have talked about it. But then uh, we had these common seminars with Eddie de Robertis, and in one of these seminars, we decided that he was working on frogs, and we were working on okay. flies. It would be very interesting to look in frogs, after all. Uh, there might be some similarities. Mm -hmm. uh, these genes might exist in other organisms as well. And this was not immediately obvious no. because frogs develop so differently from yeah. flies. And nobody had ever found some uh, common underlying mechanism between frog development and fly development. Mm -hmm. uh, so that this idea was a bit outlandish. But after that seminar, Eddie came to my office and we said, listen, uh, you know, here we, we are on the same floor, and you work on frogs, I work on flies, and why, why don't we pool resources and we look for these things in frogs? Now, independent of that, uh, Bill McGuinness already had looked. It's a so-called zooblot. So that's mm -hmm. when, you, uh, when you take DNA from various organisms. He went to an aquarium shop and bought some uh, mealworms, and some, uh, he, he dug up some earthworms. Here in, in Basel? In, in, yeah, here yeah. in Basel. <laughs> and uh, then put the DNA, uh, cleaved it mm. with the restriction enzymes, put it on a gel, and looked whether there are mm. cross hybridizing sequences. Now, in insects, we were expecting to find, mm -hmm. and we found a nice ladder of various homeobox genes. And uh, he had a nice test. We, we used two different probes. We used an Antenopedia probe and a UBX probe. But then he became more bold and he, he, uh, he used uh, mouse di chicken DNA, mouse DNA, yeah. and human DNA. And yeah. all of them had very nice bands. And then I knew that this was really something important because these genes then must be conserved in evolution Mm -hmm. and must be a common underlying principle, not just for flies, but up to humans. And that turned out to be just the tip of the iceberg. Later on, more and more genes were found to be shared mm 
But these are the most basic ones determining the body plan. Where do your arms grow out? And the, the body plan is determined by these genes, and it's the same genes in flies as in humans. So nobody had expected that, but that's what it turned out to be. So I think that was a very important finding. Then I have to tell another story. Now we're coming back to our DNA binding proteins. Okay, I postulated that antenna PD is a gene which turns on all the leg genes to make a leg. So we would conclude this must be a DNA binding protein, mm -hmm. like the lac repressor. And now we go back to the function of this protein. Now what would be the function of this homeobox, or homeodomain as we call it in the protein part? And this uh, was then first studied by John Shepard in the biophysics department. Mm -hmm. But when he heard about this homeobox discovery, he came down to the second floor, to the cell biology floor, and he wanted to work on this, on this exciting aspect. And he was one of the first to use these computer databases mm -hmm. uh, when they were still very embryonic uh, and very small. And, uh, we asked him to put our homeodomain mm -hmm. into a database and look for homologies. So if you let me just sort of restate, at this point you had this excitingly, wonderfully conserved motif. You had a, a, a sort of parallel hypothesis that stated that they would be involved in regulating transcription. Yes. But at the moment there wasn't anything tying the two together in a, in a really right. molecular uh, That's way. That's right. So what, what so is the function of this? Uh, thing and uh, the physicists now try to search databases mm -hmm. for homologous sequences. And then he hit upon something totally unsuspected. He showed that there was a little bit but significant degree of homology to the yeast mating type genes. But I realized immediately that what the, heat, what the mating type genes do is actually uh, they allow the cells to differentiate yeah. either into a cell of the mating type A or of the mating mm -hmm. type alpha in yeast. And that's like a homeotic change, that's cell differentiation in the pure sense. And uh, it just shows that these sequences go way back uh, before even animals and fungi mm -hmm. separated. And, uh, and the important thing was that uh, the MAT alpha, the gene yeah. product of one of these mating type genes, had conclusively been shown by the yeast geneticists to be a DNA binding repressor molecule. This notion that there would be genes conserved, literally, at least hinted at by the yeast data, um, from, from yeast to flies to now you identified what appeared to be corresponding genes in mice and, and man uh, in your lab. I guess this was one of the first times during this period, the early 80s, where, where this idea really took hold uh, in the scientific community. And then people found more and more right. and more homologies. Yeah. Uh, also differences, of course. There must also be differences, mm -hmm. but uh, 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 Evolution always uh, keeps uh, things constant, over conserved over very long time. Things which work well are very highly conserved in evolution. I remember, Walter, visiting the lab during this period and, and going back to the United States with my little probe of Antennapedia to, <laughs> to use uh, to probe. A, in, in Our interest was in a test of cDNA library, and I think we were just among hundreds of people who all of a sudden realized that we had a tool to go, to go fishing for developmental genes. Yes, that was, that was a very uh, exciting period. In fact, uh, Frank Rottle was on sabbatical during mm -hmm. this time, and he, uh, he wanted to do writing in Basel. And, and then there was all of this excitement in the lab and he couldn't stand <laughs> it to stay in his office writing right. anymore. So he yeah. went back to the lab bench and together with Bill McGuinness they cloned the first mouse genes. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then you came and, and uh, one of the first actually was Denis Dubou who mm -hmm. came and uh, asked me for the Drosophila probes to fish out the vertebrate yeah. probes. How did you make the link 
between the fact that you knew that these genes genetically were directing um, the development of a body plan and now translate that to the molecular level, really correlating the, the body plan with their expression? Yes. That was a, that's a wonderful story, which mm -hmm. I, I should tell okay. you. <laughs> the, uh, so there was this young student, Ernst Hoffen, who came to me and wanted to do a, a thesis with me. Shortly before okay. uh, Antenna PD had been cloned, it was just in the final stages, and uh, I asked him to try to develop an, a, a method for in situ hybridization of uh, DNA probes to the messenger RNA existing in uh, tissue sections. Uh, Michael Aikam had begun to work on this in David Hognes's lab, mm -hmm. but the methods were not really working yet. And I wanted to detect what was thought to be very rare messengers. But this was one of the myths which came over actually from the Lacry press. So the thought was that these regulatory molecules would be extremely rare, one or uh -huh. two molecules per mm -hmm. cell, and then they would be Idea, impossible, impossible to discover. Yeah. Later on, we measured that uh, Fujitarozu is present in 20,000 copies per cell. So it was not that difficult to detect it. So nature worked in our favor. Furthermore, my Akem had developed it for a very abundant uh, gene, which is abundantly expressed mm -hmm. in the gut. But uh, they, so they, they never could use it for homeotic genes. So I put Ernst on this project. And I told him, this is a high-risk project. If you uh, don't get any results mm -hmm. within two years, I will give you something much safer, where you mm -hmm. can really get uh, uh, resu results almost instantaneously and if you work hard. <laughs> yeah, and the thesis, because yeah. that's what he wanted to get. And, uh, and he was one of these guys who would take a high-risk project, you know. I like these highly motivated students. And then uh, Michael Levine came as a postdoc. He had been in Alan Garan's lab, where I had been a postdoc. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and Michael and Ernst formed a wonderful team. Uh, Michael brought the latest methods back from Yale, and, uh, and Ernst uh, had uh, the message from Mike Aikam, and they, they combined, they joined forces, and finally uh, they got it to work. And uh, just when the first antenna PDA cDNA clones became available, mm -hmm. they had the message standing. And we saw the first hybridization of uh, antenna PDA cDNA to embryo okay. sections. And where did it hybridize? It hybridized mm -hmm. in the, mostly in the second thoracic segment. And that was actually what had been expected on genetic grounds because antenna pedia transforms uh, the antenna into mm -hmm. a second leg, not into a first leg, as you would intuitively think, because it's on the head. Right. No, into a second leg. And mm -hmm. the second leg is uh, made by the second thoracic segment. So antenna pedia doesn't specify the antenna, mm -hmm. but the second leg. And therefore, we had hybridization in the embryo in the second thoracic segment. So that made sense. But then came the real exciting thing, and that was the Fujitarosu gene. So I put uh, the ja a Japanese postdoc on the That's Japanese gene. Yes, <laughs> so I asked uh, Otsushi Kuroiwa, who had been doing the walk with Rick Garber. For, they had walked for two and a half years without much uh, result, but now the results were coming in. So uh, he decided to characterize the Fujitarazu gene. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then uh, when we got the orientation of the gene right, which at that time was not that easy yet, uh, as it is nowadays, uh, and then he, we found that it also had a homeobox. And then Otsushi comes to my office and says, I want to use uh, together with Ernst, this new method of in situ hybridization to study Fujitarazu. Now, Fujitarazu is a segmentation gene, and uh, 
it has an interesting phenotype. It takes out every other segment. It has a so-called Peru phenotype. So the loss of function mutant removes every other segment. Then you get a very short embryo, which is, of course, lethal, and has only half the number of segments. That's what the name Fujitarazu means. And Atsushi predicted that the, the missing segments, which were every mm -hmm. other segment, they should normally in the wild type express the Fujitarazu mes messenger RNA. And if the messenger mm -hmm. RNA was not produced, that part of the body would be missing. And uh, now it was known from laser ablation experiments what the body plan of Drosophila looks like. So if you destroy certain cells on the blastoderm of Drosophila, you actually have to destroy more than one. But if you s a small group of cells here, you get a defect in the second thoracic segment, mm -hmm. small group here in the abdomen and so on. And you mm -hmm. could map the various segments right. on the uh, theoretical blastoderm. So we would use, we would draw these stripes onto the fate map. Mm -hmm. Every body segment represented by a stripe. And uh, this, but we, we had really no, no direct basis for mm -hmm. this. And then uh, Otsushi and Ernst took the messenger RNA or the, the cDNA or even the chromosomal DNA, I think, at that time for Fujitarazu and hybridized it to this blastoderm. And, uh, and then I remember that all of a sudden I was sitting on my desk. They both came running into my office and told me, you must come to the microscope. And they pulled me to the microscope and there they were. The stripes, stripes. the zebra stripes, the yeah. seven stripes of Fujitarazu were exactly there, as predicted. So the, the fate map was physically projected onto the blastoderm. And for the first time, we could see with our eyes the, the body plan right. outlined on the embryo. That was one of the most exciting moments in my life. Uh, I mean, it was really so clear. So that visual these, uh, too. these were. Uh, the body yeah. plan genes. Yeah. Here it was, it was outlined. And later we could also mm -hmm. detect antenna pedia on the blastoderm. The methods became more, more and more mm -hmm. sensitive. And then we saw a single stripe just in the second thoracic segment region. So it was quite clear that first the body plan is subdivided into a repetitive pattern of segments and then each segment is assigned its own fate, its own identity, and that's where the homeotic genes came in. This approach of this uh, visualization of, of anterior, posterior, dorsal, ventral positioning within an, an embryo was obviously, um, I think, initially developed most beautifully in the Drosophila, but one of the things that we haven't talked about yet is what happened as the, uh, the organization of the homeobox containing genes uh, in, other, in higher organisms, such as, let's say, mouse, uh, became obvious. The fact that they were not just distributed randomly throughout the genome, but in yep. fact, there was this remarkable collinearity that was maintained. And I, I remember being just really astonished by this. Uh, as well. Yes, this was very surprising. Mm -hmm. The collinearity was first found by Ed Lewis for the bithorax complex. Yeah. And uh, detailed genetic analysis revealed right. uh, a nice correlation between the, the chromosomal localization of the gene and where this particular mm -hmm. gene is expressed on the body plan. But this was only from the th thorax on backwards. This was from T2 to abdominal 8 mm -hmm. or 9, and the head region was always enigmatic. And the person who really had the idea that it would also include the head region was Tom Kaufman. Mm -hmm. And actually, both Ed and I were also skeptical initially, because for the head region, you don't have this very mm -hmm. clear-cut relationship in Drosophila, because Drosophila mm -hmm. is already quite diverged, uh, highly evolved, mm -hmm. and the uh, collinearity is not as clearly visible as, uh, as for, the, uh, for the posterior segments. Mm -hmm. The head is, 
involuted and reorganized and so on. But when we found the homeobox, we could show this collinearity beautifully because uh, it took us two and a half years to walk to Antennapedia, and then within three months, we had 11 other Hox genes. We had our hands full, full of, uh, of Hox genes because you could use this small homeobox as a probe to fish out all the, all the other genes. And then it turned out that uh, the sequence was absolutely like uh, Tom had predicted. Uh, the, the entire body plan from head to tail was basically determined with the exception of the very uh, tip of the head determined by these Hox genes. And uh, later on, it was found that even the very tip of the head was uh, also uh, specified by homeobox genes. And then uh, the, <coughs> the mouse people, Antonio Simeone, yeah. took the Drosophila probes with mm -hmm. Dr. Boncinelli, and they found again the same thing in the mouse, mm -hmm. that uh, these Drosophila head genes were also the specifying the head, the head of the mouse. And when uh, Denis Dubull and, and uh, many others in, in vertebrates began to get together all the Hox genes in these four okay. complexes now, the sequence was even better conserved than in Drosophila. So you had Hox 1 to 13 all in a row. Uh, some clusters have missing members, but uh, the, the collinearity rule was very nicely yeah. con con uh, confirmed. And uh, mm. the astounding thing is that the uh, normally genes are just randomly scattered around in the genome. There are very few cases where you really have highly ordered genes, but these genes were really highly ordered. So this is again a universal Absolutely. feature which, which came as a surprise. And I, I think at the time it was just, it was, it was such a surprise that, and, and the fact that then you could make these wonderful maps, you could take the locus and then you could put, you superimpose the embryo and look at the in situ hybridization. Sure enough, the, yes. <laughs> that, that, uh, that linearity was maintained and not just, across, not just within one locus, but as you mentioned, four in, in four, mouse, four in, in, the four in human and, yes. and so on. Whereas Amphioxus still has one cluster. Yeah and uh, seems to be that by generating more clusters and more redundancy, the vertebrates have uh, accomplished a much higher complexity. And within a very small amount of DNA. That's that right. was one thing that also was very striking yes, about the evolution. Yes, is much bigger than the, than the, the homologue in the <laughs> mouse. Right. That was another surprise because yeah. usually it's the other way around. And you can learn something from the mouse going back to Backwards, the... Backwards, of course. Absolutely. Of course, <laughs> right. yeah, absolutely. One of the uh, things that I know has been really uh, of great value in your uh, career and sci is the scientific interactions that somehow have formed at a, just a special time uh, in your life. And I'm thinking that you now had this idea that, in fact, these homeobox proteins were going to be DNA-binding proteins. Um, and there was a lot of circumstantial evidence for this, but there you really, at least I knew you we were thinking about wanting to get at, to a more biophysical level, really the structural uh, aspect of this putative DNA protein interaction. Right. Uh, this is the, the success story of the work collaboration with Kurt Wüttrich. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. We had a Swiss meeting on the, uh, the Swiss Union of Biologists. And Kurt Wüttrich gave a very nice talk. Yeah, he was in Zurich at the time? He or? was at the, at he okay, still he is at the ETH in okay. Zurich. And he had developed these methods for NMR structure determination of small proteins. So I called him up and I asked him, uh, how much protein would you need? How much homeodomain would you need to determine the structure? So... Mm. Uh, Did you, had you worked together before? Did you even know each other, really? We knew each other a little bit, uh, but very little. So anyway, I mm -hmm. I uh, called him up on the phone, asked him how much protein would you need, right. uh, or w would you would you be interested in trying that? And he said yes, of course. Mm -hmm. I had given an, another talk in this uh, 
meeting and he got interested in my work and I got interested in his work. So that, that seemed to click immediately. Mm -hmm. But then he said, yeah, well, you should uh, provide about 100 milligram of homeodomain, uh, but it has to be very pure to do the NMR analysis. So I, I was thinking in terms of micrograms, and he was <laughs> thinking a thousand, a thousand fold more. <laughs> And I, I almost had a heart attack when I heard yeah. this, and I, I was <laughs> grasping for air, and then he asked me, are you still on the phone, you know, and that kind of thing. <laughs> and then I worked up of all my, my courage, and I said, I will ask my, my most brave graduate student whether he, he wants to try to purify 100 milligrams of antenna pedia homeodomain. Mm -hmm. And that was Martin Müller. And uh, Martin took it rather well. And so we, we got, in the first round, we got uh, 12 milligrams, and I called court up as we wanted to try wanted this on a small <laughs> sample. And so I wouldn't trust uh, the mail system. Mm -hmm. So we, we drove to Zurich and brought the precious 12 milligrams to Zurich. And they, they did a wonderful job. Just on these uh, 12 milligrams, they solved the complete structure of the... That was just the protein alone? That was the okay. protein alone. Matt Scott and, and we had proposed that maybe uh, mm -hmm. the homeodomain specifies a helix turn helix motif. As we, you have in LAC repressor, in lambda repressor, okay. and many of the bacterial repressor molecules have a helix turn helix motif. And we thought, well, it's conserved all the way down to yeast, why not all the way down to prokaryotes? And uh, when they solved the structure mm -hmm. of the pure protein, they found that indeed it had a helix turn helix mm -hmm. motif, which was a bit different, much longer recognition helix than in bacteria, but it was an honest to God helix turn helix mm -hmm. motif. But now the challenge was to get the DNA yeah. protein complex, and that's, that's another famous story. So. Uh, this is the mo one of the most expensive experiments I've done in my life because for that purpose we had to label uh, the protein with C13, uh, an isotope, non-radioactive isotope, which you can see in the NMR. And uh, the label alone cost me $8,000 for one experiment. And, uh, so again, Martin Müller took the mm. challenge, and we mm. proceeded in a typically Swiss way. You know, Swiss people are the most insured people in all over the world. <laughs> so what we did was, instead of making one big flask of bacterial culture, okay. we made 12 uh, <laughs> separate ones. So if one got contaminated, yeah. it wouldn't be a total disaster. And, uh, and they all worked fine, and, and we, we pooled the bacteria extracted the protein, Martin purified it, and, uh, and we, we brought it to Zurich. Mm -hmm. Now, the bacteria didn't grow so well in this, in this label. We couldn't afford glucose. That would even have been more expensive. Uh, so we, we fed them on acetate. And uh, so we go to Zurich again. Okay. not trusting anybody else, bringing the protein, handing it over to, uh, to his uh, postdoc, and then uh, we drive home proudly and think, uh, great accomplishment. And then next morning, Kurt calls me up and says, it has all precipitated when we added the DNA. Oh. So we had uh, $8,000 on the bottom of this <laughs> tube, great. Uh, yeah. and a lot of work mm -hmm. and then we, we, we started scratching our heads and asked uh, why could it have uh, precipitated and Kurt said well you probably didn't remove all of the salt and uh, I said mm -hmm. well I don't know I'd have to ask Martin but so he suggested that we simply dialyze it against distilled water to get rid of the salt now, it's a very simple experiment so they dialyzed it overnight Next morning, calls again and says, it has gone beautifully into solution. So, 
these $8,000 came out of the ashes and uh, the recognition helix binds into the major groove. But we also found minor groove contacts, which we had predicted. Uh, Tony Persil Swiss and, and Marcus Offold did a wonderful job on the biochemistry side of it. And we had done mesylation, desylation, mm -hmm. interference experiments. And they were all very nicely in line then with the, with the final structural data. So this was an extremely yeah. successful uh, collaboration. So you're now in a position where you had these fascinating mutations identified genetically. Uh, you now had the reagents, the, the, the genes in hand, so that you could actually begin to look nucleotide by nucleotide, amino acid by amino acid, as to how these motifs were, were functioning. That's right. And that's still going on. Yeah. Uh, Any surprises? And uh, yeah, the there are there are uh, still big surprises ahead, I think. And it turns out that the first alpha helix, which is not involved yeah. in DNA binding, which is actually facing away from the DNA, that is involved in protein-protein interactions, and those could be uh, much more important than we have previously thought. So there's a whole new story now coming up that these proteins form large protein complexes that's known from other transcription right. factors, but that the regulation is also controlled by protein-protein interactions and that they uh, repress each other. So Walter, we've been talking about the, uh, the homeobox motif domain, um, predominant most so far in the, uh, in the Hox class of uh, genes. But I know um, that the, this motif is showing up everywhere. <laughs> Not everywhere, but in other really interesting genes. genes yes. So has that actually been uh, a way for you to identify and get into some other aspects of development that, uh, in recent years? Yes, but this, this was a mere accident. But it started again oh. with, <laughs> with uh, homeoboxes. Okay. And uh, I had a graduate student, uh, and she had found that in front of the Fujitarazu gene and of the caudal gene, two genes with homeoboxes, right. there was a shared sequence which looked something like an enhancer, which was shared between the two genes. And those are, of course, interesting because they might indicate some co-regulation mm -hmm. of these two homeobox genes. And so I asked her to try to clone the transcription factor which binds to that particular sequence. Okay. And uh, is, there was this new method at that time, it was fairly new, which was developed for using oligonucleotides for screening expression libraries and ask which of the proteins can bind this particular okay. oligonucleotide. And with the help of Steve McKnight, who had developed these methods, uh, he provided us with all the tools, which was very kind of him. Uh, and she, she tried to identify whatever binds to that particular sequence. Now, to have a, a positive control, which, which should work, I gave her a homeobox binding site. And, uh, and then she never found anything which would bind to her site. Mm -hmm. But she found something nice which bound to the homeobox site. And that would have been of extreme interest to me if there is a protein which binds right. to a homeobox binding site, which is not a homeobox protein itself. So there might be, you know, competitive interactions for these mm -hmm. binding sites. Anyway, I, now you clone this thing and we'll see. Right. And so she sequences in the first 500 base pairs and then the second 500 base yeah. pairs. And then uh, I said, I told her to, to contact the EMBO database to send it to the M by computer to Heidelberg and to search for homologies. Mm -hmm. So we come back from lunch and I'll never forget that moment. The, the computer just spits out homology after homology. And the first homology was the mouse small i gene. That is the PAC6 gene. And mm -hmm. the second one I think was Drosophila paired and the third one was another Pax gene, and so on. For me, this was one of the exi most exciting moments, because I realized then 
that by in situ hybridization, Urs Klotra had mapped that for her to the fourth chromosome, and on the fourth chromosome is a gene called ILES. And, uh, and uh, PAC6 encodes uh, the small i gene in the mouse, and in human this corresponds to the Oniridia gene in human, and they all abolish eye development at the very early stage in homozygous form. So when we had shown that this was the eyeless was homologous to small eye, homologous to aniridia, I had this crazy idea that maybe this is the universal master control gene for eye development. But this idea was, uh, was too crazy. I presented it in Crete at the Drosophila workshop and uh, it was vividly discussed, but nobody so that this would uh, was it the idea that it that about master control genes in general, or the idea that you could have a master control gene being responsible for such divergent structures, or both? <laughs> well, <laughs> the, 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 both. I, the most the term master control gene yeah. was uh, invented probably by Hal Weintraub when he mm -hmm. found myoD. MyoD is a muscle yeah. determining gene. And I think he called it the master control gene. But Ed Lewis, too, he used the term for the homeoptic genes. Mm -hmm. So I, I used it currently in Ed okay, Lewis's okay. sense because we were working right. on Hox genes, too. But what Ed had found was that uh, to specify a given segment in the body plan of Drosophila, it was always a combination of Hox genes. There was a Hox code. So that All two, right. three, four different Hox genes were yeah. expressed in a given segment. Mm -hmm. uh, they had a specific anterior border, mm -hmm. and then, but posterior, mm -hmm. all of them were expressed. Mm -hmm. So the idea of a single gene. Of a single gene right. encoding yeah, an okay. eye, or a specifying or eye. That was a <laughs> wild idea. Okay. Now, uh, and there was another problem. When you take out a homeobox gene, you take out ultrabiothorax. You don't get uh, a fly which has no sec uh, third thoracic segment, but you get a transformation of that yeah. third so thoracic segment into right. a second thoracic segment. That's because you change the code. You take out one of the code words, but mm -hmm. there are two others which are now expressed, mm -hmm. so you get a transformation. So I wasn't sure about my idea at all, because the eyes were odd. The eyes, when you take out the gene, the eye is missing right. and is not homeotically transformed right. into something else. So I wasn't uh, all that sure, but uh, nevertheless, I, I, I love gambling and uh, <laughs> I banked on this idea. You know, a complex structure like an eye, which has evolved mm -hmm. over millions of years, how can a single gene yeah. trigger eye formation? And I said, well, let's, let's try it. You know, I've, I've converted antennae into legs, so. and why can I not convert a wing into an eye? And there, that's yeah. where my thesis work comes back in, because transdetermination yeah. can induce a cell fate change in wing discs, so that all of a sudden the wing cells now produce eye structures. And I had seen that. It was a very rare event, but I had seen it once, mm -hmm. so I knew Nature knew how to mm -hmm. do that. Mm -hmm. Question is, can we mimic nature or can we find out how nature does that? And, uh, and so I recruited two guys in the lab, uh, Patrick Kallertz, a Belgian postdoc, and, and uh, George Holder, a Swiss graduate student. And they were brave enough to, to, uh, to try this high-risk project. So what were you going to try to do? The crazy experiment was to ectopically express now the eyeless gene instead of in the, on the head, to express it on the wings, on the legs, on the antennae, and mm. see whether by switching on a single main switch gene, master control mm. gene, whether we could induce eye formation. And they tried two months, three months, four months. And one evening they were playing bridge with Marcus Affolter, and they said, well, we must go and see Walter tomorrow. It doesn't work. But before coming to my office, 
they still looked at their latest constructs. And surprisingly enough, some of these had red patches on their legs. So they called me in and asked me, is this eye pigment or what is this kind of red spot which they have on the legs? And I saw it one glance, you know, I've seen so many flies, I know how, how red, <laughs> so the red is. And right. these were eye pigment spots. Mm. And only pigment, no lenses, no. nothing else, but pigment. And then I knew it was possible. Because if you can switch on the pigment cell right. program, you must be able to switch on the earth. And then, and then I wouldn't let them off the hook. Uh, and then three weeks later, we had the most beautiful eyes on the legs, on the wings, on the antennae. And uh, that was, of course, a feast. And, because and in the that one I had, <laughs> I had, uh, I I had uh, predicted. And it's very rare to make a reasonable prediction mm -hmm. in biology because evolution doesn't work logically. It works with tinkering. And Francois Jacob has mm -hmm. said this very nicely. Evolution tinkers, puts little p bits and pieces together of pre existing things and then alters and alters. We later on we could show that with the eyes on the antennae, they can actually see. That the, how do you prove that? You can make an electroretinogram. So you, you put an electrode over the antennal eye or control eye, and then a reference electrode on the abdomen. You give a light pulse, and then you record on the oscilloscope, and you see, you know, not an auction potential, but you see an electroretinogram. And it's completely normal for the, the nice antennal eyes have a completely normal electroretinogram. We actually followed the nerve fibers mm -hmm. which come down from the antenna into towards the brain. Now the question is where do they go? Do they go to the optic center or do they go to the antennal center? Now the optic center they're of, of course already full because the normal eyes occupy these right. sites with the normal axons. And the antennal eye, though, ends up in the antennal center. Now, this to me raises the interesting possibility that these flies can smell the light, you see. Because when you shine light on them, <laughs> oh. they now think they smell yeah. something because it goes to the antennal yes, center. Signal. Where, uh, and, uh, and so we are trying to prove that now, or disprove it, with behavioral tests. Do they really think this is an odor now if you shine light on them or is this or do they uh, respond in a different way? And so I, I gave this talk and I suggested this in Bern and then the person who invited me, Isabel Roditi, said, well, I, I have a mutation like this. And I said, oh, oh, what, what's that? So she said, uh, I can see digits like when you read a phone number in color, and so does my sister. But the rest of mankind sees phone numbers in black and white. And uh, so they must have a some, somewhat different uh, connection in the brain, which brings color vision together with, mm -hmm. uh, uh, with digits. And uh, it's much easier to remember a phone number if uh, four is always green and blue is always a five. And, uh, very and so, useful. Very useful, <laughs> yes. And I, I've read up now on some of these uh, memory artists, and they, they usually associate two senses with one another, uh, like a, a, sm a smell of sense of smell together with uh, photoreception. So this, this, uh, this is just for the fun of it. That's my ex expedition yeah. into neurobiology, which is really... Uh, very minor, but it's fun to do. Yeah. Can can the mouse gene rescue the the fly mutation? That's right. That was my second dream experiment, which okay. I told Patrick and George to do, mm -hmm. simply to take the, the the mouse gene, which is identical in sequence to the human gene, very highly mm -hmm. conserved, stick this into flies, and see whether it can induce ectopic eyes, and it does. So flies can understand mice. And of course, they make a drosophila eye because you've only exchanged the main switch. It's like yeah. coming into a house. Before you can turn on all of the lamps all over the house, you have to pull the main switch. And the main switch is from the mouse, but the rest of the genes mm -hmm. 
You need at least 2,000 genes to make an eye, therefore you get a Drosophila eye. And we've also tried the reverse, so we have put the Drosophila gene into frog embryos, and in frog embryos we can use ectopic eye structures with the Drosophila gene. The eyes are not as nice as in flies, but we're doing pretty well. Sometimes you get a complete eye duplication on the injected side, the non-injected side is completely normal. You get two eyes on one side, mm -hmm. which are almost normal. To what extent can um, the mammalian genes or the frog genes rescue eyeless? Have you tried that? Yes, yes. They can rescue very well. Mm -hmm. But there is a complication. In Drosophila, we, mm -hmm. we now found, we later found that there are two genes, whereas in humans there is only one. So there is an eyeless and a twin of eyeless, and twin of eyeless is more closely to the, related to the human gene than eyeless in terms of sequence and also function. And the uh, twin of eyeless, we have made now a null mutation, which mm -hmm. takes out the, the gene function mm -hmm. completely. And they have a terrible phenotype. They, they are essentially headless. They only have a oh. proboscis and a thorax and nothing in between. So that's the mo much more dramatic effect than the one who takes just away the compound eyes right. and leaves the head with the ocelli and the antennae intact. So the two genes have diverged and also diverged mm -hmm. in function. Uh, twin of eyeless has much more uh, to do with head formation, entire head formation, mm -hmm. antennae, that would be the nose in the mouse, mm -hmm. and brain formation. and. Uh, eyeless is more concerned with the compound eyes. Okay, so the idea that these are master control genes and these genes are functioning as transcription factors, uh, either positively regulating genes or in some cases perhaps repressing uh, genes. Yep. What, are you, what are we learning now about what are, these, what are the downstream targets? That's right. And now here comes modern genomics, of course. Mm. So. Uh, Okay. You use uh, microarrays yeah. or you use DNA chips. What we would like to compare is the entire cascade from the master control gene on top all the way down to the structural genes like rhodopsin, the visual pigment and so on for Drosophila and for the mouse and see what is conserved and what is new. What does it take to make a mouse eye versus a Drosophila? How many new genes do you need? We know that uh, several New genes have to be recruited, but we know that PAC6 is by far not the only one which is conserved. There is a second in command, that's a, so PAC6 has two DNA binding domains, a paired domain and a homeodomain. Mm -hmm. The second in command is called Cineoculis, or six invertebrates, and that has only a homeobox. That's directly controlled by PAC6. And then there is another cascade but uh, PAC-6 has a, at least uh, only at one developmental stage we have already found more than 20 direct targets for PAC-6 or very likely direct targets, immediate early mm -hmm. genes which are induced very rapidly. And uh, at later stages there will be more and more. So I th we, we estimate from an enhanced trap screen which Jerry Rubin made that there are at least 2,000 genes mm -hmm. which, uh, which are involved in, in eye formation. With regard to these 20 or so direct targets of, uh, of eyeless that we're talking about, are these targets of the homeobox or the paired box? Or yes. is there interaction between the, these two motifs? Yes. There, we are now just uh, analyzing this in more detail. And one of my students has made truncated proteins in which he took out either the paired domain or the homeodomain. Mm -hmm. The surprising thing is you take out the homeodomain and you can still induce ectopic eyes. So it seems that in terms of activation of target genes, it's mostly the paired domain which is important. And later, he obtained very strong evidence that the homeodomain is involved in repressing uh, a gene called distillus. And this is very important. When I uh, 
described the Nasrabimia phenotype mm -hmm. as a graduate student, I strongly emphasized that what this gene had to do, this homeotic gene, was to turn on all the leg genes. But what I didn't emphasize, and what is actually equally important, is first it has to switch off the antennal program, to, so you have to repress the antennal gene, and then and you can install activate, yeah. a new program. Yeah. And uh, that seems to be done by the homeobox in the case of eyeless. Mm -hmm. So at first you have distalis expressed both in the eye and in the antennal disc. And uh, the distalis specifies the antenna together with two other genes. But you don't want distalis to be active in the eye field. So what uh, eyeless does first is to switch mm -hmm. off distalis in the eye field and then you can install the eye program. Now, when you take out the homeobox, eyeless can no longer switch off the antennal program in mm. the eye disc, and you get a duplication of the antenna. Instead of an eye, you get an antenna. It's exactly a transdetermination from eye to antenna. Uh, it's not a duplication event, mm. but it's a transdetermination event, a, a cell fate change, which is induced by the the missing homeodomain, which is supposed to repress distalis. You know, Walter, eye. it's remarkable. I, I, I think there are very few of us who can really now have a molecular explanation for something that has fascinated us since you were a graduate student, <laughs> undergraduate, <laughs> or even, and perhaps even more so, that that same question is still worth asking. Of course, <laughs> of course. You, is, uh, you is keep pretty working wonderful. on your thesis for the rest for of the your rest life. Of, well, I don't <laughs> think many do. I think this is, this is kind of a remarkable situation yeah, um, for right. you. Do you have any, anything that, when you think about the students you have today and advice that you give them? My mentor, Hadon, was uh, really a, a zoologist by training. Mm -hmm. And when I switched to Yale to work for Alan Garren, Alan Garren was trained as a physicist, biophysicist, and his uh, reasoning was much more rigorous than a biologist's reasoning. Uh -huh. You know, it's that mm -hmm. kind of quantitative, exact scientific reasoning which a physicist or a mathematician has. And I've tried to, to acquire that from Alan Garren and the, uh, the rich biology from Haddon yeah. and the imaginative uh, imagination from Haddon and that that was my background and I hope to to give this to my to my students. I think the the good thing about my group was that I granted the students a lot of freedom. You work best on a on a topic which you like. Yeah. If you only moderately like yeah. it, you'll never accomplish a super job. But if you love the task which you are given, then you are highly motivated and you accomplish much more. And then you don't have to interfere. Uh, you just have to uh, sometimes to steer them or to provide yeah. them with new ideas and new and techniques. Encouragement and, and <laughs> encouragement. I think for the students, the, the major influence is actually to be, to be a model. For science, for me, it has to be mm -hmm. fun. I always have this enthusiasm, and if a student comes and tells me his latest result, and I can get very excited, <laughs> and uh, and I think that's yeah. the best encouragement. I was very lucky in having yeah. extremely good students, and uh, well, even two Nobel laureates among my students, which I'm fairly proud of. Of course, it's their own doing, but they uh, mm. they started this work back in my laboratory, and. Uh, so I'm, I'm very happy about them being successful. And I've trained something like 30 or so professors all over the world right. as postdocs here. Yeah. Uh, one of the strengths of my lab is the very international composition and every, every country or every culture adds something special and creates this uh, creative atmosphere, which yeah. is very important to do research. Well, that, that was very obvious. If I can remember, if I can recall, a very special recent uh, time when, on the occasion of your 60th birthday, that's that right. was a great party. And just looking around at the people who were there, 
um, in terms of, as you've just been alluding to, where, where having passed through the, the Gehring Lab and how they are affecting science and the future scientists in terms of their accomplishments now, must have been incredibly rewarding to you. Yeah, yeah. and it was so nice to see that they, uh, they come back here. They still have the friendship which they made mm -hmm. in Basel. They collaborate from Australia to Mexico to North America to Poland or, or to Hungary. And uh, so that, that was extremely nice for me to see. If you look back over, uh, over all of these many wonderful discoveries, these exotic eyes and all this stuff, what, is, is there any one discovery that really you think to you has meant a personal high? Well, the, uh, the two absolute highlights, of course, were the discovery of the homeobox and yeah. the uh, discovery of the master control okay. team for the eye. Yeah. And I was lucky to have two such, uh, such highlights and when we first looked at these Fujitarasu stripes or when we first mm -hmm. saw the the red spots on the legs of the fly, and then a huge eye on a wing, and yeah. uh, those are those are the highlights. And but there's a lot of uh, grinding out of, of work, which which you just have to do to get to these few eureka moments. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard yes. someone refer to them. Yes, <laughs> eureka. Is that that's, a good? Uh, exactly. Oh, that's exactly. Actually. Yeah. Exactly the term when you when you really uh, make a, a big discovery. And in biology, as I yeah. said, it's hard to predict, mm -hmm. but you also have to be prepared for the, for the exception. Well, and, uh, and that actually brings us to the prepared eye, but I don't think we should <laughs> <laughs> develop on that. Walter, I really, I can't thank you enough for your time this afternoon, but, but really for sharing your, um, what were hopes and dreams as a, as a starting graduate student and, and how a career evolved, and most of all, sharing your excitement for the scientific discoveries that you've made. Thank well, you. I thank you for asking just the right questions, I think. <laughs> <laughs> it was Great. very, very pleasant and for me.